Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is the first part of the Sequence Homology Searching Lecture Series. Over the next few lectures, we're going to talk about what Sequence Homology Searching is and when and why you'll use it. <clears throat> we're going to begin by looking at an algorithm that does a complete Sequence Homology Search against a database, and then we're going to explore some properties of that algorithm, including the runtime. After that, we'll look at variations on that algorithm that apply some tricks to get to the right answer in less time. We're, we call those heuristic, uh, heuristic algorithms. Finally, we will wrap this up by talking about how to evaluate whether a pairwise sequence alignment is statistically significant. Over the course of these lectures, I'm going to be using um, Jupyter Notebooks to work through the code that is presented in the corresponding book chapter. I recommend that you also work through the code, um, either doing this on your own computer or using the binder service. It'll help you to understand these concepts if you're experimenting with them a little bit as we go. The first thing I want to do is I want to introduce a couple of terms that we're going to use a lot throughout this, um, throughout these lectures. Um, the first of these terms is homology. And we have mentioned this a little bit in the class um, so far, but I want to bring it up since it's very central to these lectures. So when we're talking about sequences or other biological traits, homology means that the trait has derived from an ancestral state of that trait. Um, for example, in the previous chapter, we looked at the hemoglobin protein from a few different ma uh, mammalian species. The hemoglobin sequences that we were looking at were all homologous. They all derive from an ancestral organism's genome who encoded that, uh, that hemoglobin gene. Now, some differences arise over time. Um, and we, in the last chapter, we're talking about computing the distances between those sequences using Hamming distance. In this chapter, we're going to be talking more about similarity uh, between sequences rather than, dis uh, rather than distances or dissimilarity. And so the other term I want to introduce now is similarity. So we will use this to infer homology. Um, but it doesn't necessarily imply homology. Um, and so when we talk about the similarity, say, of a pair of sequences, um, we can think about that in a very similar way to how we thought about Hamming distance. So remember, Hamming distance was the fraction of positions that differed in a pairwise sequence alignment. Similarity is the inverse of that. And so you can actually compute it as 1 minus Hamming distance. Um, and so the, um, the other way to think about that is it's the fraction of positions that don't differ from one another in a pairwise sequence alignment. Um, and so um, similarity and distance or difference are really two sides, two sides of the same coin as we're using them here. A very important thing to remember and which people often get mixed up um, is that uh, homology and similarity are different things. One does not um, necessarily imply the other. Um, and so homology specifically is a discrete variable that has two states. If you have a trait or you have a pair of sequences, those sequences either are homologous or they're not homologous. They either do derive from an ancestral state of that sequence or trait, or they don't. Um, similarity, on the other hand, is a continuous variable. Um, when we think of it as a fraction, it can be any value between 0 and 1. And so if we see a high similarity between a pair of sequences, like we saw between our hemoglobin sequences in the last lectures, that we usually use that to infer that there is homology between those sequences. Um, one thing that uh, where people often get mixed up is they'll say something like these two sequences are 75% homologous. That's an incorrect use of the term. Um, what they probably mean is that the sequences are 75% similar and as a result they infer that those sequences are homologous, that they are derived from a common ancestor. There's no such thing as being um, a certain percent homologous. They either are or they're not homologous. 
Okay, so now that we have introduced those terms, I'm gonna switch over to my Jupyter Notebook and we can start working through um, some of the content in this, uh, in this section. And we're gonna do this by loading up some uh, example sequences that we're gonna use in our uh, similarity searching. Sequence homology searching typically begins when a researcher has a query sequence, um, and that sequence could be um, any DNA, RNA, or protein sequence, um, but the key is they want to get some more information about what that sequence is or where it come, came from. An example of this could be a protein sequence of unknown function, um, or it could be, say, a nucleic acid sequence that uh, came off of a DNA sequencing instrument, um, and the researcher is interested in knowing, say, like what source organism that sequence came from. They would typically solve this problem by searching that, that query sequence against a reference database of annotated sequences. Um, if this was, if they were trying to find the function of an unknown protein, that might be um, something like the NCBI protein database where there are annotated protein sequences. Um, if this was, say, a 16S ribosomal RNA sequence that they obtained from an environmental survey, they might be searching against a taxonomically annotated database of ribosomal RNA sequences. Um, the, the key features here, though, is that there's a query sequence that they're interested in learning more about, and there's a reference database that has uh, relevant sequences with the type of annotation that they are interested in, either functional annotation, taxonomic annotation, maybe both of those, um, or maybe something else. So you've actually probably run into this um, already. Um, you, uh, this particular problem, and you've probably solved it using the BLAST web server. Um, so the BLAST web server implements a sequ sequence homology search tool, um, and there's several reference databases that are built in there that you can search a query sequence against. So what we're going to be doing in this chapter is exploring how something like the BLAST uh, database server would work. In the last lecture, we covered um, local pairwise alignment of sequences, and we looked at a few different um, algorithms for doing that. Um, we talked in detail about the needleman wunsch algorithm, um, and we talked in a little bit less detail about the Smith-Waterman algorithm for doing local pairwise alignment. In this chapter, we're gonna be using the local pairwise alignment um, uh, algorithm, Smith-Waterman, um, and we're gonna use a function that's coming from the Scikit-Bio library called local pairwise align SSW. You'll recall from the last chapter that this was a performance optimized variant of Smith-Waterman. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do in my notebook here <clears throat> Um, and, I get, and again, I encourage you to follow along with me um, by running this notebook yourself on the Binder web service. <clears throat> but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import that function, and I'm just going to call help on it so I can get some information about um, how it runs. Um, and so I just ran this by hitting shift return on my keyboard. You could also click the run button that is at the top of the notebook. Um, so you can see here, this is telling us that we are getting help on this function. And if we look at some of the details of this, we can see that this is taking two sequences as input, and these can be DNA, RNA, or protein sequences. For the exercises here, we're gonna specifically work with uh, DNA sequences. This next cell here is um, just something you have to run. If you're looking at the static version of this chapter online, um, this cell is, is probably hidden from view, um, but it is important just to set up some of the functionality that we're gonna be using throughout the rest of the notebook. Okay, so the... Um, the 
sequences that we're going to be working with in this chapter come from a database that is called Green Genes. Um, and Green Genes is a collection of small subunit ribosomal RNA genes. Um, that's also, you may see that as abbreviated as SSU for small subunit or rRNA for ribosomal RNA. Um, but the uh, sequences that we're going to be working with here are a subset of the Green Genes database, um, which is, like I said, a collection of these ribosomal RNA sequences, and these have been taxonomically annotated. This Green Genes database is um, specific for 16S, um, and so unlike the NCBI databases, um, it's not just a database of, of any sequences and associated, associated annotations. It's a database of this specific gene sequence. Um, this is convenient when you're working with um, a specific um, sequence, uh, for example, because it um, will tend to be better annotated than the general purpose reference databases. And so somebody has built this database specifically of these 16S sequences, um, and they will, um, um, as a result, therefore, put more effort into having correct annotations for these sequences. It's going to be orders of magnitude smaller in terms of number of sequences than something like the NCBI non-redundant nucleotide database. <clears throat> We're going to be obtaining these sequences from a resource called the Chime Default Reference. Um, and I'll just note that this is actually um, sort of a legacy project. This is not something that Chime is using by default anymore. This is something that was used in Chime 1. Um, but we're using it here because it's just a very convenient way to access this collection of 16S ribosomal RNA sequences from within Python. So I have a function here called load taxonomy reference database. Um, and when I execute this cell, um, what it's doing is it is um, building a Python dictionary. Um, well, actually, yeah, so when I run this, which I'll do in this next cell here, um, what this is doing is it's building a Python dictionary called reference taxonomy. Um, and it is iterating through all of the sequences in this database um, and assigning the sequence ID to the taxonomy that's associated with those sequences. It then looks at a different collection of files in this database um, and it is associating in this case the sequence, uh, uh, the sequence for each record with the identifier and it is adding the reference taxonomy to that database, uh, or sorry, to that entry in our collection. When this function wraps up, it um, returns both the reference taxonomy and then this reference DB, which is our sequence collection. Um, if I run this with the parameter verbose equals true, it also prints some information out for us. Um, and so this is telling us that it loaded 88,000 sequences from that reference database. So let's take a quick peek at what a few of these sequences are. And so um, with this command that I have here, I'm going to look at the first sequence record that is in this database. Um, and so, the, um, so if we look at this line by line, this is telling us that this is a DNA record. Um, it's giving us the ID for that sequence. And so this is um, a unique identifier that's gonna be associated with this particular sequence in this database. And it's telling us the taxonomy that is associated with that sequence. Um, when we look at these taxonomy strings, which we're going to see a lot of in this chapter, um, you'll see that these are seven level taxonomy um, descriptions. And so this includes the kingdom, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and the species that this particular 16S ribosomal RNA sequence was isolated from. 
Now you'll notice in this particular record that the kingdom, phylum, and class contain a lot more information than the order, the family, the genus, or the species. What this means, um, so here you can see there's no entry for order, for family, genus, or species. What that means is that this sequence is not annotated to those lower taxonomic levels. So we know what class the organism uh, is whose genome this came from, but we don't know any other taxonomic information. We don't have, for example, a genus and species associated with this sequence. Um, and so this is a limit uh, inherent in this database in the taxonomic resolution that we have for this sequence. Um, let's look at another one. Um, so in this case, um, I'm going to look at the last sequence in this reference database. Um, and so you can see that this one um, has a different sequence identifier. Um, it also has some, a different taxonomy associated with it. Um, and so this is telling us that we're now looking at a sequence from the Archaea uh, domain or kingdom as it's called uh, by this database. Um, and this one has a little higher resolution taxonomic information. So this one we have um, down to a family revel uh, level resolution, but we still don't have a genus or species for this sequence. I'm just gonna pick a sequence more or less at random from the middle of this database here. Um, just to show you that we can um, take a look at other sequences in here by editing the code in this notebook. Um, and so I just changed this, so we're looking at sequence 42421. Um, so that is gonna be the um, uh, uh, entry uh, corresponding to the um, 42,421st sequence in this database. Um, you can see the ID associated with this one is different from either of the ones that we've seen before. Um, and this one, uh, again, actually has a little bit higher resolution taxonomy. So this one we go down to the genus, um, but we still don't have species level resolution for this sequence. Um, when we look at these, you can see we get a little bit more information in here, like we're getting the length of the sequence, we're getting an indicator of whether the sequence has gaps in it. Because these are unaligned sequences, this should be false for any of the sequences in this database. Um, we also have um, these two variables here, um, or two stats, I should say has degenerates and has definites. Um, so degenerate characters would be things like the N character that we've talked about showing up sometimes in these sequences. And so that would mean there is an unknown nucleotide base at that position. Um, definites is the opposite. So that is a non-degenerate character. So that would mean that there are A's, C's, G's, and T's in that sequence. Hopefully every sequence that we load from this database is going to have definite characters in it. Um, hopefully it would have been filtered out from this database at a quality control step, if not. Um, it also reports the GC content for these sequences. Now to keep uh, things running fairly quickly for these lectures, um, we are going to just work with a random subset of that database rather than the full 80,000 sequences that are in there. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to import the random module from the Python um, standard library. And in that random module, there's a function called sample, which allows us to provide a list and a sample size, which is indicated by the variable k. Um, and it will, at random, choose k values from um, that input. And so if I run this, what I'm doing is I'm um, subsampling down from the 80,000 sequences to um, 5,000 sequences. And so this should enable us to do database searches
uh, much quicker, which is helpful for um, helpful for illustrating this um, relatively quickly. Um, so in this case, we are just going to work with 5,000 randomly selected sequences from the database. Now you'll notice as you're running this along with me, when we start running individual steps of this, when we start running queries against this database, we may get different results from one another. And that's because we um, this uh, selection from the database is happening at random. And so if you run this on your computer, you're going to have a different randomly subsampled database than I am. Um, so that's not a big deal, and that'll be um, useful for um, you uh, if you want to say go through this a few times and see how the results differ as you're trying to understand this. Um, but uh, you'll notice we're going to get some results that differ from one another, and that's why. Okay, so we now have this subsampled reference database defined. And for every sequence in that database, we have a sequence identifier. We have taxonomy that is um, associated with that sequence. And so essentially, that's our known taxonomy for that sequence. And then, of course, we have the sequence itself. The next thing I want to do is I want to load some query sequences. And so this will be a collection of sequences that we can search against that database. Um, the um, other thing that I want to do here when we um, define these query sequences is I want to simulate how we are typically collecting sequences from the environment with modern DNA sequencing instruments. Um, and so with our modern sequencing instruments, you may or may not know, we typically don't get full-length gene sequences, um, at least for sequences um, that are about as long as the ribosomal RNA, so about 1,500 bases long. Most of our sequencing instruments these days give us sequences that are on the order of about 200 to 400 bases long, sometimes longer, um, usually not shorter. Um, and so what that means is we don't have the entire gene sequence to uh, try and identify taxonomy. We might only have a, two, a length 200 fragment of that sequence. Um, and so when I load some sequences to, uh, to treat as our query sequences, I'm gonna pull them from the same database. So from this green genes database, but I'm going to simulate the sequencing workflow. So I'm going to start always at the same position. And this is essentially simulating the uh, PCR reaction. So like imagine that we would start at position 100 because that is where our forward primer would, um, would anneal to, the, to our target sequences. And then to simulate um, sequencing, for example, on, a, on an Illumina MySeq instrument, I'm going to specify that I want the length of my sequences to be 200 bases long. I'm also not going to compile the taxonomy information here because remember these are our query sequences. And so the idea here is that these are unannotated sequences. Um, so I'm gonna run this cell. Um, and then I'm going to, using that random sample again, I'm going to load 50 query sequences from the database at random. Um, that'll just take a minute to run. Um, and once it is done, we can look at our query sequences in the same way that we were looking at our reference database sequences above. Um, so here I'll look at the first of our query sequences. You can see we have some ID associated with that. Um, you can see now my length is 200. Um, I don't have any taxonomy associated with this, again, because this is an unannotated sequence that we're simulating here. Um, and then you can see the sequence that I have down here. So this would be the full 200 bases that we have for this particular sequence.
um, I will get another query here, um, and you can see this mu looks much the same. The ID is different, the sequence itself is different, but the report looks the same. Okay, so now we have this collection of unannotated query sequences, and imagine that we want to know what taxonomy should be associated with each of these sequences. Um, and so in other words, what, uh, what organism's genome did this sequence come from? In order to solve this, I have defined a function here called local alignment search. And what this function um, takes as input is some collection of queries, some reference database, um, a value called n, which is defined as the number of hits that we want to get back for each one of our sequences. Um, and so the number of hits will be, um, from this function, will be the, um, say, if we go with the default of five here, will be the five sequences that achieve the highest alignment score with a given query. As we step through this, we will look at exactly how that works. Um, we're also going to take some function that we use to do pairwise alignments. Um, the function that we're going to use, like I mentioned before, is this one called local pairwise align SSW. Okay, so the way this the way that this works is we are going to iterate through all of the queries, and we're going to do a, a database search using pairwise sequence alignment for each of those queries. Um, for each query, we are going to compile a list of hits, um, and then we're going to iterate over all of the sequences in the reference database. For each one of the sequences in the reference database, we are going to compute a pairwise alignment. And we're going to do that with that aligner function that we provided. And here we're aligning, you can see, one query sequence with one reference sequence. We get an alignment back from that, and we get a score back from that. Now, I created this list called hits. And so for each alignment that we do, we're going to um, keep track of the ID of the sequence in the reference database, the score of the alignment, we'll keep track of the pairwise alignment itself, and then we'll keep track of the taxonomy that is associated with that hit in the reference database. Um, this next line, um, might look a little bit intense here, but what we're doing is um, once we have computed all of those pairwise alignments, so an alignment for a single query and then all sequences in the reference database, we're going to have a score associated with each one of those. Um, and remember that the higher the score, um, the uh, well, a higher score implies um, a better alignment. And so if you think back to the pairwise alignment lectures, um, remember that like when we were aligning things that didn't match, we were giving them a negative um, score. So for example, if we were aligning, um, say, an A and a T, there would be a negative score associated with that, where if we aligned an A and an A, we would have a positive score associated with that. What that translates to is that higher scores are associated with more matches in the alignment and typically with fewer gaps in the alignment. And so what we do here is we reverse sort all of these hits by their score. And so the highest scoring um, alignments will be the first ones that show up in this list. Um, then I'm using some uh, syntax here at the end to select only the top n of those. And so in our case, we're gonna, we have n equal to five. And so this is how I'll select the five best hits that come back from uh, each of these searches.
Um, we then just do some information where we are recording um, the uh, we are recording some uh, information about these. So if there's no no good hits here, um, we log that information. Um, most of the time, we will end up with um, uh, getting some good hits here. We will have. Um, we will therefore start building up this result object where we're going to track the percent similarity, um, the length of the alignment, um, and then we're going to track the, um, the ID of the query sequence and the ID of the reference sequence. Um, and we will put that with the taxonomy, the percent similarity, the alignment length, and the score, in this results object, and then we're just building up a table that presents all of these results. This last bit, um, don't worry so much if you don't follow everything that's going on there. Basically what I'm doing is I'm just building up a table, um, and we will then get to look at that table and get a summary of our alignment results. Um, those summaries are similar to what you see in the BLAST output when you run a BLAST search. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this cell. It won't do anything because all I've done so far is, def is define a function. I haven't actually called it yet. Um, and I'm going to do something else here which we'll um, use a lot more in the next lecture. Um, but I'm going to um, also compute the runtime for doing this search. Um, and so um, without worrying too much about like how these times are computed, um, I basically get a start time. I then um, am running my search here. Um, so I'm sampling down to um, just four query sequences for this search. Um, I then am going to do the local alignment search. That's that function that I just defined. Save the results in this uh, object that I'm going to call results. Then we stop timing. We can print out the runtime, and then we can print out what the results are. And so I'll go ahead and run this. And that'll just take a minute to run. And when that completes, um, you can see first, we get some information about how long this took per query sequence. Um, so we had, um, we put four queries in here and you can see that this took about four and a half seconds or four and a quarter seconds per query sequence that we put in here. Now this table that was being built up at the end um, is going to um, present the query sequence ID and then the five best hits in our reference database. Um, so the, this column here is going to be the reference IDs. So these are the IDs for the best hits in the database. These are then the taxonomy associated with the best hits in the database. This is the percent similarity for the alignment between the query sequence and this particular reference sequence. This is the length of the alignment, and so that'll be those um, two sequences plus any gaps, and then the score of the alignment. Um, and so you can see here for this first one, I'm getting five hits coming back and the percent similarity between my query and reference sequences is ranging between about 75% and 86%. Um, if we look at this next one, you can see that my percent similarity are, they're higher here, so I'm getting about 84% to 94%, um, and so on. So like here, I'm getting 81 to 85%, and down here at the bottom, I'm getting 92.5% up to 94%. Um, now, one unfortunate thing about how this table prints, um, you know, it's very nice in how it um, like prints out so you can differentiate these lines from one another. 
Um, but you'll notice that these reference taxonomies are a little bit cut off. And so that's not super useful for what we're trying to do here. Um, and so I just have a little bit of code down here that prints this um, sort of in a less pretty but more informative way. Um, if we compare these two outputs, we could get, for example, full taxonomies um, and then uh, the percent similarity and so on that we're looking for. Um, and so you'll see when I you'll see when we look at these that the amount of taxonomic information and the consistency of the taxonomic information is going to differ for the different sequences that we have in here. Um, and this is a way that we can start thinking about what is the actual taxonomy that is associated with our query sequence. Um, and so when we see something like what I have in this first example, um, and remember, yours are going to differ from mine because we are using different random databases. Um, but here, like what I'm seeing is that all of the top five hits are sequences that are in the domain Archaea. But when I get down to the phylum level, I can see that some of the top hits are, um, for example, like this one is to the Crenarchaeota, the phylum Crenarchaeota. Um, the second one is to the phylum Uriarchaeota. Um, and then you see I have some other Crenarchaeota, some other Uriarchaeota. Um, when I come down to the class level, um, you can see that I've got quite a bit of variation there as well. And so within the Crenarchaeota, I'm seeing two different classes showing up. Within the Uriarchaeota, I'm just seeing one class show up. Um, but when you get something like this, what this should tell you is that this is not um, a very informative um, database search result here because you're getting a lot of inconsistency in the best hits that are coming back from this database. Um, and so there's a few ways to think about this. Um, for example, you could say, well, you know, what is the best hit? That one had 86% similarity. Um, and so, and then the next best hit only had 76% similarity. Um, and so maybe you want to do something like say, um, well, I'm just going to assume that this is the taxonomy that is associated with my query sequence because that was what the closest match in the database was. Um, but another way you might want to think about this is by comparing the top few hits. Um, and so, you know, because there's no agreement in the top five hits uh, as to what phylum this sequence came from, maybe you're not so confident. Maybe you don't want to just assign it to this first taxonomy because the next best hit is from a very different, um, very distantly related organism. Um, and so you might instead think about um, only assigning this to what you know to be absolutely true or to be the most commonly true. Um, and so for example, you can be pretty confident that this sequence comes from the archaea because all five of the top hits are sequence are uh, are two sequences that come from archaea um, and so what you might want to think about is uh, how much resolution you want to give to the taxonomic assignment that you derive from this database search um, if it were me doing this, I would probably just assign this to the taxonomy archaea here because there's so much disagreement. Now, let's contrast that with, um, for example, what is showing up um, for my third query here. Um, and so this third query, um, if we scroll back up, we can see that I got database um, matches from about 81.5% up to about 85.5%. And when I look at the taxonomy associated with those, you can see that the five best hits that I got for this sequence, the five highest scoring alignments, were um, consistent in their taxonomy all the way down 
to the genus. And so this is bacteria, um, and I'm not even gonna really try and pronounce all these um, different levels here, um, planktomycetes, um, all the way down to this genus, planktomyces. All five of these best hits from the database are annotated all the way down to the genus level with the um, genus planktomyces. So I can be pretty confident that this sequence comes from the planktomyces genus, um, if not probably something very closely related to that. Um, we have a similar situation for my fourth query. Um, this one, we um, have a consistent taxonomy all the way down to the family level. Um, this one is interesting up here. So my second one, you can see that we have a consistent taxonomy at the phylum level for all five of my sequences. Um, and so this is the phylum Bacteroidetes. Um, but then at the class level, we start to see some variation sneak in. And so, um, so we see Cytophagia, Bacteroidea. Um, and so, you know, we may or may not um, feel confident assigning this at the class level, but we can certainly feel confident assigning this one at the phylum level. Um, it's always good to compare these with the um, alignment score, or sorry, the alignment percent similarities that we're getting. Um, and so, for example, we see up here, I've got a 94% match for this first sequence, but only about an 88% match for that second sequence. And so maybe in this case, since we have such a close match, you're confident um, in assigning maybe at some of these lower levels, um, but you know, you've got a way um, how, uh, you basically have to weigh like how much resolution you want for this sequence versus how frequently you're willing to be wrong about some part of that assignment. So if you can tolerate being wrong sometimes, then maybe you want to give a higher resolution assignment to a, se uh, to a sequence. If you can't really tolerate being wrong, um, like you need to be very precise here, then you probably would want to opt for a lower resolution assignment. And so maybe then you just want to assign what you're absolutely confident in here, which would be this Bacteroidetes assignment. Um, now, one thing that's handy about the way that we're doing this is that, remember, when we built our query sequences, we built them from that same database that we had taxonomic annotations for. Um, and so we can um, actually go and check and see how often we got um, the right answer here. Um, and so I'm gonna run through this now and have this print out the known taxonomy for each of these query sequences, and then we can compare that against the results that we saw. I would encourage you to work through this exercise a few times where you select different random query sequences and try and figure out what taxonomy you are comfortable assigning to your different query sequences based on these results and then compare that with the actual known taxonomy for each query sequence. Um, and so if I go ahead and run this, um, you can see that I'm now gonna get the um, known taxonomy for each of these. Um, okay, so this first one, 122879, um, you can actually see, so this happens to have the same taxonomy as that first one that we got. Um, and so in this case, like we probably could have assigned it out to this, um, this class here, um, but we, um, we didn't because we weren't necessarily very confident. Um, the next one here um, was um, this uh, Bacteroidetes, um, and you can see, again, in this case, we had taxonomy that was very similar to the best hit. Actually, it was identical to the best hit that we got for this. Um, the taxonomy for my third query, 
is identical to the taxonomy for all five of our queries there. So we were right that time and thinking that because these were all consistent, we should we could um, confidently assign to that genus Planktomyces. Um, and then this last one, um, you can see um, same situation where we have um, a taxonomy that is identical to what we ended up with for um, uh, all five of our best hits. Um, okay, so um, we have now worked through um, these examples of uh, do, going through four query sequences with a complete database search. Um, so as a reminder of what we did here, um, for each one of our queries, we performed a pairwise alignment against all 5,000 sequences in the reference database. Um, and that took about four seconds per query. Um, so that actually seems like it's pretty quick, but if you start thinking about the fact that we might have to do this on thousands of sequences or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands or millions of sequences, that four and a half seconds per query could start to add up. And so I'm gonna wrap this lecture up here, but what we're gonna start thinking about next time is how we can make some modifications to this local alignment search to try and get us the correct results or very similar results to what we're getting from this function in uh, less runtime. That would be, those algorithms are gonna be um, variations on this local alignment search, um, but they are some of the same approaches that is that are used, for example, using the BLAST web server, where they're running many, many, many queries because anybody could be putting these in at any time. Um, and they're running against uh, much larger reference databases, so many more than 5,000 sequences in the reference database. And so we'll spend um, the next lecture talking about how we can optimize this local alignment search function.